Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about ethics in research. I'm going to be touch upon issues of animal experimentation, but for most students, you'll be much more concerned with human research and human subjects. And it may seem strange that even for sixth form students that you would have to think about things like ethics and not causing harm to people, but it's a very important part of research, especially the extended project qualification. Let's start off by showing you a little clip from a very famous experiment by a psychologist called Harlow, and it was a study into dependency in monkeys. Watch this, and we'll talk about it in a moment. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Now here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. He's got to eat to live. going back. He's back on the cloth mother, and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother, and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother? Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now here we have a peaceful, resting, baby monkey. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. He's scared, all right, and he does what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical object. All right, this gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantile love. This is a six foot square room with a few toys and other objects. But to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are often overwhelmed with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkeys. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. 
Notice how cautiously he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out and put in a wire mother. Now this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right, all his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Now, we'll try the same test with a cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Despite the fact that the wire mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, as if he were seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir of affection and security. First his body relaxes as the fear disappears. But above and beyond this, new positive response patterns appear. He now goes out to explore and investigate this new, strange world. He is now a normal, happy, curious baby. Now, clearly for advocates of animal rights, that was an indefensible and despicable study and they might argue with no real end in sight of how the research would benefit humankind uh, and no real concern for the terrible detriment to the young monkey. Uh, however, of course, there is always an alternative view um, and I'm sure that Harlow would passionately defend his experiment and say that it had a applicability to the human world and that there could be good results from this. I showed you this particular clip because it's likely to generate a strong emotional response in you. And although, as I say, my topic today is not really looking at things like the treatment of animals, it does set the tone for the whole idea that when we make a study, we need to weigh up harm that we cause through the study and the potential benefits of the study. So when we look at Harlow's um, particular experiment, uh, I think there might be some defense. But animal rights advocates will often talk about the fact that many animal experiments seem to have dubious uh, benefits to mankind. So research ethics concern the responsibility of researchers to be honest and respectful to individuals who are affected by their research studies and their results. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. So going through our agenda, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background to research ethics. We're going to talk about the value of consent and transparency, two very important principles. We're going to look at the function of what we call a plain language statement, which all researchers who do human research need to write. Uh, we're going to look at the value of debriefing particip participants in experiments and studies. We're going to look at a student's plain language statement, a student in a desk who wrote this. We're going to look at the role of deception. Is it, is it uh, ethical to deceive your participants? If so, when and how? And those very difficult questions. And then we're just going to touch upon plagiarism because that also falls into the idea of ethics in research. Now, I'm going to look at some really shocking uh, historical um, examples of highly unethical research. And the first being, of course, the breaking and re-breaking of bones. Now, the Nazis in particular conducted many medical studies which were shocking in terms of their ethics. And one of the most interesting philosophical and uh, medical ethics debates that you can have is whether it's permissible to use the results of these studies or not. Another study in 1963, 
uh, had patients been injected with live cancer cells in New York. Very famously, in uh, Alabama, between 1932 to 1972, 400 men had been left to suffer with syphilis long after a cure was available so that they could study the effects of the disease. Again, that seems to be a shockingly unethical example. And a study that we're going to look at in a lot more detail now, Milgram's study, uh, he was studying human obedience. And the argument is that he conducted a study which later caused people incredible shame and humiliation. And there was a strong element of deception in the study. So once again, there are no clear answers. It's an interesting experiment for you to talk about in a moment. And I'm going to show you a video clip of the Milgram study. Here is some of the dialogue to whet your appetite. Please continue. The experiment requires you to continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no choice. You must go on. Well, let's find out where this dialogue came from. The Milgram studies were conducted in order to study the willingness of participants, average everyday Americans, to obey authority figures who instructed them to perform behaviors that conflicted with their personal beliefs and morals. And as you can probably imagine, it might be hard to recruit participants when that's what you're trying to study. And so in order to keep the participants from finding out what he was actually trying to look at, Milgram used deception. He started by posting ads looking for people to participate in a study about learning and memory. And I actually have an image of the original flyer here. And you can see that they really tried to make it a point to recruit average everyday people. When they arrived at the lab, they were told that they were going to be participating in a study that was trying to look at the effects of punishment on learning. So, do people learn best after they've been punished for making a mistake? And there were two participants involved in the study, and they randomly decided, by picking out of a hat, who was going to play the role of teacher and who was going to play the role of the learner. In reality, one of the participants was actually a confederate, meaning that they were working with the experimenter and were secretly in on the point of the study. And choosing the roles out of the hat wasn't actually random in this case, because it was rigged in such a way that the actual participant always got the teacher role and the confederates always got the learner role. While the teacher was watching, the experimenter hooked the learner up to a number of electrodes. And they were both told that the teacher was going to teach the learner a number of word pairs, and that the learner would be shocked whenever they gave the wrong answer. In some versions of this study, the person playing the learner noted that they were worried about the experiment because they had a heart condition, so they were worried about the shocks. At which point the experimenter would explain to them not to worry, that the shocks would be painful but not dangerous. The teacher was then taken to a different room where they couldn't see the learner, they had no visual contact with them. And they were sat in front of a box of switches that they were told was a shock box. The first switch was labeled 15 volts, and the switches increased at 15 volt increments until it reached 450 volts. Along with an indication of voltage, there were also labels that went along with the switches. And I've written a number of them down here, but they went from slight shock to moderate shock to strong shock, and then things like very strong shock and intense shock and extremely intense shock. And then, kind of troublingly, a label that noted that the switches would give a severe shock and the warning of danger XXX. The teacher was instructed to read a long list of word pairs to the learner, and then when they were finished, to go back and read the first word of each pair, and then offer four possible pair words. Of those four possible pair words, the learner would indicate what they thought the answer was by pressing a button, and this was displayed on a screen to the teacher. And whenever they made an error, the teacher was instructed to give them a shock at increasing increments, so the first wrong answer got a shock of 15 volts, the second one 30 volts, etc. And just so you're aware, even though the teacher thought that they were giving the learner shocks, no actual shocks were given. But of course, it was really important that the teacher really thought that the punishment was being administered. After giving a number of correct answer, the participants seemingly started giving incorrect ones. And of course, the pattern of correct and incorrect answers that the learner was given was determined by the experimenter well beforehand. And the first couple of shocks really didn't elicit that much of a reaction. The learner would kind of gasp when they happened, but nothing more than that. However, after several increasing shocks, 
the learner would start to pound on the wall and cry out in pain. And eventually, they would start to complain about their heart condition, saying things like, let me out, my heart is bothering me, let me out. And as the shocks increased, they would continue to yell and scream that they wanted to quit. And after this, after a certain point, all responses from the learner would cease and there would only be silence from the other room. If at any point during the study the participant playing the role of the teacher wanted to check on the other participant or stop the experiment or even just looked back at the experimenter for guidance to see what they should do, they were told things like, please continue, and the experiment requires that you continue, and even you have no other choice, you must go on. The experiment came to an end after either four verbal protests from the teacher from the participant or after they had given the final shock of 450 volts to the silent learner three times. Before he started his experiment, Milgram had asked a number of professors and psychology students and clinical psychologists whether or not people would obey the commands of the experimenter. And they overwhelmingly said that people would not, that most of them would stop when the learner protested, and that very, very few people would shock all the way and that those that did were probably psychopaths. And so when the results of the study came out, they were actually really disturbing because 65% of participants shocked all the way. 65%. And to be clear, those participants didn't do so without feeling. They had protested, they were sweating, and they were trembling. But they still obeyed the commands of the experimenter and shocked to 450 volts. And in the versions of the experiment where the learner claimed to have a heart condition and specifically claimed that the shocks were hurting their heart, full compliance did drop, but not by much. It dropped to 63%. And again, these were everyday average Americans who heard the cries of people they were tormenting and continued with the task. And I want to end with a quote from Milgram, and it's kind of a long quote, and I've written it out here. But I think that it's really important and really sums up the results of the study. He wrote, I set up a simple experiment at Yale to test how much pain an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to by an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the subject's strongest moral imperatives against hurting others. And, with the subject's ears ringing with the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any length on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of this study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work became patently clear, and they were asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. So as you can see, Milgram's study is highly controversial. There's deliberate deceit and deception of the participants. Arguably, many of them suffered later humiliation and embarrassment. Uh, it is a controversial study because arguably it does warn us about the dangers that Milgram believed were inher inherent in human nature. However, clearly very little thought went into the welfare of the participants. And so that's a case where I think today it would be extremely difficult to conduct that kind of level of deception in human research. It's up to you to think very carefully about this. Uh, this slide here illustrates some of the things, some of the ethical codes to think about when you are conducting research. And the first being is patient autonomy. It doesn't always have to mean patient in the sense of someone in hospital. This would mean participant autonomy. How free are they? How aware are they of the nature of the experiment, of the data? Do they have some kind of control of that data or not? Uh, no, uh, non-maleficence, difficult word to pronounce, uh, the idea of not causing harm to people, making sure that their welfare is considered in the research. And if there are some harmful effects, these need to be counterbalanced by beneficial effects.
and this that really is the same principle here for beneficence the idea that your research will provide a great deal more good than the harm that it you know causes idea of justice that there should be a, a just outcome the idea of veracity truthfulness again going back to Milgram's experiment certainly the principle of veracity was not respected in that particular case now because of the nature of experimentation after the Second World War, when it became apparent that a great deal of research that was conducted by Nazi scientists had been obtained under extremely unethical means, including experimentation on people in concentration camps, etc. Here you see a, um, a picture of the Nuremberg trial in which many of the top Nazis were tried as war criminals. Well, following the Second World War and following the Nuremberg trial, the Nuremberg Code was issued, which is a set of 10 guidelines for the ethical treatment of human participants. Again, that's in 1949. So it's a very important milestone in terms of research ethics. This was later expanded into a far more comprehensive report known as the Belmont Report in 1979. And it's a very long report, so I have isolated three principles of it that I think are important for anyone who's doing human research. The first being that individuals should consent to, to participate in studies. And those who cannot give consent, such as children, people with diminished responsibilities and prisoners, need to be protected. That's an interesting principle, isn't it? The most important one, I think, for all of us, particularly for students who are conducting research in an EPQ, or if you're going to go on to university and do any kind of human research, the researcher should not harm the participants. They should minimize the risks and they should maximize the potential benefits. Number three, fairness and procedures for selecting the participants. Okay, another important idea. How did you select them? In the APA guide, I thought there were a number of things worth um, highlighting to you. The researcher is obligated to protect participants from physical or psychological harm. Now that can be very interesting, even for EPQ people, because I have had students in the past who've wanted to study uh, their peers who've suffered from depression or eating disorders, etc. And that is very dangerous. And that's something that the APA guide deals with in considerable detail. During or after a study, participants may feel increased anxiety, anger, lower self-esteem, etc., feeling like they've been uh, tricked, cheated, or deceived. Now, again, if we go back to Milgram, I think had you been a participant in this study, you would certainly be feeling those things. So the APA guide would have protected you under those circumstances. The general concept of informed consent, that's the absolute key for you to realize informed consent. That is that human participants should be given complete information. So again, a huge change, which makes it very difficult to conduct the kind of experiments that we've seen and we saw in the past where the participants were regularly deceived. And um, the principle here of clinical equipoise is really important. This means that a researcher can compare treatments when there is an honest uncertainty about which treatment is best, there is an honest professional disagreement among experts concerning which treatment is best. Okay, So here in the diagram, this is illustrated, we have treatment A, we have treatment B. We don't know which is better, and therefore we do need to potentially give one group of people better medication or better therapy or better treatment in order to compare the incidents so that we can have some kind of empirical data that shows and proves which experiment is best. And in doing that, it may be that one of the groups benefits more than the other. So that's a very good example of a ethical dilemma. And you need to explain why and ensure understanding on the part of your participants today. So again, Milgram certainly wouldn't have done that. So if we are conducting research, we need to tell participants exactly 
what we will be doing in the study. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to uh, simply telling participants about the research does not necessarily mean they're informed. You have to make sure that they understand this. Obviously, many people would be missed. Now, because there is so much technical language in research very often, uh, researchers are required to write what we call a plain language statement. And many of you in desk and beyond when you go to university will be writing one of these. And as its name suggests, the trick is to make sure that the technical detail is translated into accessible, easy to understand English. And another thing is to make sure that your participants genuinely understand what is written in the plain language statement. And that can be quite a complicated thing. It takes time and you need to actually judge and evaluate and test their understanding. So what should be included in a plain language statement? Well, the purpose, purpose of research, what you're trying to achieve, the methods, what you're going to do, will it be interviews? Are you going to use surveys, etc.? The demands. What will you be asking of your participants? And when you do professional research, which many of you will later, that would include things like, is there a payment? And you'll be thinking about the disruption to work, etc. cetera. Uh, will people be required to talk about things that might get them in danger, like their workplace? Um, it's especially important to have a clear description of what you want the uh, participants to do. Uh, you must explain to them exactly, especially as uh, the slide says, when you have separate groups, what will be required of them. And it's especially important that you think about the risks and the benefits. For instance, students often ask me about my opinions about the school and the education system, etc. And you need to think very closely that if I were to answer those in a way that would cause my uh, harm to me in terms of my job, then you really are asking me unfair questions. And in terms of um, doing any kind of research in the UAE, we need to be very mindful of the local laws and requirements upon us, for instance. So I spoke earlier a little bit about the concept of voluntary participation. And so participants must not feel co uh, coerced to participate or perceive that they have limited choices. In my own research, for instance, I've been turned down uh, the opportunity of interviewing students. I wanted to interview EPQ students, and the university felt that this placed students in a very difficult position. Uh, they might feel coerced by me, they might feel as though they need to feed me the answers that I'm looking for, and they made the judgment that they felt that that would be unethical. Um, now, it may not be the same with you. It may not be that you have power over people so much, but you also need to think about, are you a highly charismatic person? Are you a person who's able to get people to sort of follow what they want, etc.? These are all very important things for the principle of voluntary um, participation. Now, I'm going to include, as part of the screencast, a plain language um, statement that was written by a deaf student. She studied this question, the Jehovah's Witnesses, to what extent is the organization a cult? And she wrote a plain language statement. So I'm going to include that in or alongside the screencast. And it would be a very interesting exercise for you to read this, to go back to what should be in a plain language statement and to consider whether you think that this is a well-framed plain language statement. And if not, if you feel as though there are some flaws in it or some omissions, it would be an interesting exercise for you to note what you believe that these are. I will pause the screencast now and give you time to do that. Ideally, you've had time to look very closely at the plain language statement and possibly to discuss it in a group or with a friend. Uh, will you need to write a plain language uh, statement. Well, this is something, again, that you should discuss with your peers, first of all, especially if you're now in a lesson, or if you're with a group of people who are conducting a project like the EPQ. Will you need to write one? If so, what will you have to explain? And what are the dangers to your participants? And 
how will you protect your participants from harm? One of the key ideas is that you will protect the identity of people. So you need to think to yourself, how will you make sure that these people are anonymous? How will you protect their data? How will you make sure that they're not identifiable to other groups? Will you, for instance, be giving them a code, Mr. X, for example, etc.? And as I say, a very important aspect of this is that people have the opportunity of reviewing things like interview transcripts and say, no, I'm not happy with this being published. It's a very, very important principle. And it's the kind of thing that could have your research disqualified at university level if an ethics board decides that you have not been vigilant in respecting participants' rights in this manner. Now, we saw earlier with Milgram that there was a large element of deception. So we have passive decep deception, which is omission, not telling people stuff. And I guess Milgram would say that that was passive um, deception. The research intentionally does not give all of the facts. They're economical with the truth. And then, of course, there's active deception or commission. And this is presenting misinformation about the study to participants. And the most common form of uh, active uh, deception is misleading the participants about the specific purpose of the study. So again, we saw that in Milgram. He was actually looking at obedience, but he pretended that he was looking at the effects of punishment and learning. Now, we get to this very tricky idea of, is there such a thing as justified deception? And the deception must be justified in terms of making some kind of significant benefit. And the researcher must consider all the alternative. Deception should be the absolute last strategy and technique used. And you should be able to justify this. It's extremely rare for ethics boards to uh, pass this kind, of, um, this, this kind of technique these days. And in terms of the EPQ, I cannot think of any time when this would be possible. So my advice would be no deception, transparency making sure that people are informed. The principle of informed consent should be your guiding philosophy. Now, the idea of debriefing and confidentiality I touched on a moment ago. I think debriefing is a key one because once you've collected your data, uh, you may feel very excited and want to publish it. But ideally, you should sit down with your participants and discuss your findings. Now, again, Certainly at undergraduate level and postgraduate level, you would have to do this. And the APA ethical guidelines require that researchers ensure the confidentiality of their research uh, participants. So as I say, this idea of keeping their records safe, keeping them anonymous, because sometimes people are surprised by the consequences that things can have. And if we are in a area in which there is strong political power, we need to think very carefully about the damage that we can do to people, even in something like an EPQ, because you may believe that it's kind of quite harmless. But sometimes there are extraordinary consequences that come from getting people to speak freely, hence the need to uh, make sure to protect their identity and to ensure that there is anonymity. So the reporting of research, and this is where ethics now become part, partly to do with collusion, partly to do with things like plagiarism. So the principle is not fabricating data, not changing the transcripts in your interviews, etc. That is considered a kind of sacred trust of the researcher that you are true to the transcripts. You do not rewrite them or fudge the survey results or round up the data too much to make sure that it fits the kind of curve that you want. If you discover significant errors in published data, they will take uh, reasonable steps to correct such errors. And very importantly, you do not present uh, others' work as your own. And I've done other screencasts about the value of plagiarism and what a heinous crime it is within the academic world. So the reason, one of the reasons why we have peer review is to safeguard us against fraud. 
and the safeguarding against fraud, the peer review ensures uh, things like that your research could be replicated. It looks at the integrity of the research. So, and that's why even on things like the EPQ, we try to have transcripts of the interviews, etc., to ensure that uh, peer review can replicate the results of your research. We've had a huge amount of information for you to absorb, and I hope it wasn't too dull for you. So let's see how much of it you understood. I'm going to look at potential EPQ projects, and I'm going to ask you to fulfill my role. You're the kind of judge, the coordinator. And I think this would be a very interesting exercise for you. I would like you to look carefully at each of the proposals. And I would like you, if possible, to discuss with this with some peers or in a group. But if you don't have anyone with you, think about them really carefully. And think about, would you approve these projects? Would you ask for changes? Or would you simply say, listen, this is far too uh, dangerous. This is potentially extremely unethical. You cannot pursue this particular project. So have a look at these. There are no right or wrong answers in this particular case. Well, in some cases, I think there are. But it's an interesting exercise, and you can apply all of the principles that we've looked at so far. I'm going to stop the screencast now so that you have time to do this. Now, I hope you've had time to look at that and to think really carefully about those. I'm not going to go through them now. I think it's very interesting for you to formulate your own opinions. Another issue just before we come to the end of the screencast, is the idea of plagiarism. And it's much like the idea of manufacturing results. This is also an ethical issue for researchers. So passing off others' work as your own is a serious, unethical thing to do in terms of research. And I strongly advise you to watch my screencast on plagiarism, the reasons behind it, and how to avoid it. And in order to avoid plagiarism, as I've said before, the acknowledgement of one's influences and sources is absolutely key. So we are often inspired by other people, and that's a good thing, yeah? Um, I think that this is an interesting quote. After working on a project for an extended time, it became difficult to separate your own words and ideas from that that came from outside sources. As a result, outside ideas and phrases can appear in your paper without appropriate citation. Now, that's something that you can write about, but it's not an excuse for deliberately copying other people's ideas. In my final slide, I've put together a number of YouTube video sites for you to look at if you're interested in this. There's an excellent overview of ethics here. This is a very good video on how to write a plain language statement if you're wanting to do that. Here's a further video on the principle of informed consent. And the final video is about ethics and psychology research, which is a particularly tricky one. So I hope that this has given you some ideas. It's extremely important if you are doing human research that you discuss this with your supervisor. And I would strongly advise you to go and see a coordinator or an academic mentor before you actually frame and design the research. And you should have things like your plain language statement checked very carefully indeed. Good luck with your research. I hope that you found this an interesting video. I shall see you again.